Welcome to Jeremy's IT Lab. This is a complete course for the CCNP N-Core, Enterprise Core exam. This course will cover all topics you need to know to pass the N-Core exam. In this video, we will move one layer up from the previous video and look at layer three forwarding. Specifically, by layer three forwarding, I mean forwarding of internet protocol packets because IP is the dominant layer three protocol. Much of the content in this video will be review from the CCNA, but I am reviewing it for a good reason. It's absolutely essential that you understand the contents of this video before moving on to more advanced topics. Also, we will be covering some details not mentioned in the CCNA course. Here's what we'll cover in this video. First, we will look at the XOR and AND operators that hosts use to determine if a destination is in the same subnet. This isn't something you actually have to learn for the NCOR exam, but I consider a general education that someone studying networking should be aware of. Then we'll look at layer 3 forwarding within a LAN, meaning within the same network, the same subnet. Then we'll look at layer 3 forwarding between networks, which is where routers come into play. As part of this, we will also review how routers make forwarding decisions, how they decide which route in the routing table is the best one to use for a packet. Then we will review how to configure IP addresses, and review some show commands to verify their configurations. Finally, I will introduce the concept of directed broadcasts, something we didn't cover in the CCNA. Now let's do some math. Don't worry, it's not so complex. Also, although I think it's a good thing to understand for anyone studying networks, you will not be asked to do something like this on the NCORE exam, so don't worry. Now, the question is, how does a network host, for example your PC, determine if a packet should be forwarded to the default gateway, for example your home router, or if it can be forwarded directly to the destination host? If the source and destination are in the same subnet, the packet can be forwarded directly to the destination. That means the packet will be encapsulated in a frame, and the destination MAC will be the destination host's MAC. But if the source and destination hosts are in different subnets, the source host will send the packet to its default gateway. That means it will encapsulate the packet in a frame, and the frame's destination MAC will be the MAC of the default gateway. For a host to determine if the destination is in the same subnet or not, two operations are used. XOR, which stands for exclusive OR, and AND. These are bitwise operations which means they are used to operate on a number, such as an IP address, at the level of its individual bits. You'll see that in action soon. First up is XOR, which is used to compare the bits of the source IP and destination IP. If two bits are the same, the result of the operation will be zero. If two bits are different, the result of the operation will be one. So let's look at an example. Host 192.168.1.10 with a slash 24 prefix length, is sending a packet to 192.168.1.99. So here are the source and destination IPs in binary. Let's use the XOR operator to compare them. This is the result. To put it simply, the XOR result identifies which bits of the two addresses are the same, with a zero, and which bits are different, with a one. And that's it, the XOR operation is done. But with this alone, the source host can't identify if the destination is in the same subnet or not. Anytime two hosts have a different IP address, some of their bits will be different. But that doesn't mean they are always in different subnets. So let's move on. After the XOR operation, the AND operation is performed. AND compares bits of two numbers and will give a result of 1 if both bits are 1, but if either or both of the bits are zero, the result will be zero. Now, what two numbers are we comparing using AND? Remember, with XOR, we compared the source and destination IP addresses. The sending host uses the AND operator to compare the XOR result and its own subnet mask. So let's perform an AND operation on the previous XOR result and the source host's net mask. As a reminder, the source IP is 192.168.1.10 with prefix length slash 24, and the destination IP is 192.168.1.99. .1 
Here I have written the XOR result and the subnet mask. So if we use AND to compare them, the result is this, all zeros. Remember, if both bits are 1, the AND result is 1. If either or both of the bits are 0, the result is 0. If the AND result is all zeros, it means the source and destination are in the same subnet. So the source host can send the packet directly to the destination host. It will encapsulate it in a frame destined for the destination host's MAC address. In this case, the result was all zeros, so both hosts are in the same subnet. However, if the result is not all zeros, it means the hosts are in different subnets, and the source host must send the packet to its default gateway for routing to the destination. Let's do another example where the destination is not in the source host subnet, from source 192.168.1.10/24 to destination 192.168.11.1. So here are the two IPs in binary. If we compare them with XOR, this is the result. We have identified which bits are different. Those are the bits that are 1 in the XOR result. The next question is to identify if those different bits are in the host portion or network portion. For that we use AND to compare the XOR result and the source host subnet mask. This is the result. This time there are some ones in the AND result. And because the end result is not all zeros, the source host knows the destination is in a different subnet. So the source host will send the packet to its default gateway to route the packet toward the destination. The source host can't send the packet directly to the destination. So to summarize these operations, XOR is used to identify which bits are different between two addresses. The subnet mask identifies the network portion of the address. And if any bits of the network portion are different, the two addresses are in different subnets. And the AND operation is used to determine if this is the case. If the different bits are only in the host portion, it doesn't matter. The hosts are in the same subnet. However, if the different bits are in the network portion, the hosts are in different subnets. Okay, that's all we'll cover about these XOR and AND operations. Now let's take a closer look at how a host forwards a packet within a LAN. This is something you should already know well, but let's review. When a host sending a packet has identified that the destination host is in the same subnet, it can send the packet directly to the destination host. And how does it determine that the destination is in the same subnet? Now you know, by using the XOR and AND operations. In this case, there is no need to send the packet to a router for routing. Routers route packets between networks, not within the same network. So the packet will be encapsulated in an Ethernet frame, and the destination MAC address will be the destination host's MAC address. And how does the source host know the correct MAC address? It will check its ARP cache for an entry matching the destination IP. If there is no entry, it will send an ARP request. I will make a separate video looking at ARP in detail, but you already know the basics from the CCNA. So let's say PC1 is sending this packet to 10.0.0.13, PC3. The source MAC is 00505611111. It's not written in the diagram, but this must be PC1's MAC address because it is the one sending the frame. Now what should the destination MAC address be? The destination is in the same subnet. So PC1 can send the packet straight to PC3, meaning the destination MAC should be PC3's. Here is PC1's ARP cache. Notice that there is an entry for PC3's IP address, 10.0.0.13. So PC1 will use that MAC address as the destination of the frame, and it is forwarded directly to PC3. When the source and destination are in different subnets, the process becomes a little more complicated, but you should know the process well from your CCNA studies. When the XOR and AND indicates that the destination is in another network, the source host will send the packet to its default gateway. In the example network here, that means that PC1, 10.0.1.10, sends the layer 3 packet to PC2, 10.0.2.10, but at layer 2, the frame is destined for R1's G01 interface MAC address. 
Then, when the router receives the frame and pack it inside, it will change the destination MAC address to that of the next top router, R2's G00 interface in this case. It will also change the source MAC address to that of its sending interface, R1's G00 in this case. There are some other things it will do, such as decrementing the IP time to live field. Remember, if this goes to zero, the packet is dropped. It will also recalculate the IP header checksum and Ethernet frame check sequence before forwarding the frame. Then, when the final router in the path receives the frame, it will change the destination MAC to that of the destination host, which is PC2. It will also change the source MAC to that of its sending interface, R2's G01 in this example. And once again, decrement the TTL and recalculate the IP header checksum and Ethernet FCS. And that's basically how forwarding works at layer 3. However, there is a major difference in the decision-making processes of layer 2 and layer 3 forwarding that we should review. Layer 2 forwarding decisions involve looking for an exact match in the MAC address table. Here's an example. A frame arrives on the F01 interface of this switch. The switch then checks the MAC address table for an exact match, which is the one I've highlighted in red. Partial matches don't count. The entry in the MAC address table must match the destination MAC address exactly. Then the switch forwards the frame out of the appropriate interface as indicated by that matching entry in the MAC address table. That's layer 2 forwarding. An exact match is required. However, layer 3 forwarding decisions made by routers involve looking for the most specific match in the routing table. This means that partial matches are okay. Here's an example. A packet arrives at this router, destined for 203.0.113.27. The router will check its routing table for the most specific matching route, which means the matching route with the longest prefix length. What is the most specific matching route out of these three? It's this one in the middle, for 203.0.113.16-28. It's more specific than the route for 203.0.113.0-24, although that is also a matching route. The third route for 203.0.113.32-29 has a longer prefix length, but it doesn't match the destination packet. 203.0.113.27 isn't part of the 203.0.113.32-29 range, so it's not a matching route. So, the router will then forward the packet out of G02, as indicated by the route. Now, if there is an exact match in the routing table, meaning a slash 32 route to the specific destination IP address, that will be the most specific matching route. But the point is that it doesn't have to be an exact match. For routers, a partial match is okay. When it comes to making a layer 3 forwarding decision, the matching route with the longest prefix length wins. You may be wondering, what about administrative distance and metric? They are used to determine which routes are added to the routing table. For example, if a router learns two routes to 192.168.1.0/24, one from EIGRP and one from OSPF, it will select the EIGRP route and insert it into the routing table because it has a lower AD. Or if a router learns two routes to 10.0.0.0/24, both via OSPF, it will select the route with the lower metric and insert it into the routing table. But after routes are in the routing table, a router will use the most specific matching route rule to make forwarding decisions. It won't look at the AD and metric of routes. So here's an example question. R1 receives a packet destined for 192.168.1.35. The following routes are in its routing table. Which route will it use to forward the packet? So, there is a rip route to 192.168.1.32-28 with a metric of 10, an EIGRP route to 192.168.0.0-16 with a metric of 1000, an OSPF route to 192.0.0.0-8 with a metric of 5, and a static route to 192.168.1.32-32. Which route will it select? These routes are already in its routing table. There's no need to think about AD or metric, even though you know, for example, RIP has a higher AD than EIGRP, OSPF, and static routes. 
These routes have already been selected for the routing table. So the only thing R1 is thinking about when making a forwarding decision is the most specific matching route, which is the RIP route to 192.168.1.32 slash 28, because it is the matching route with the longest prefix length. The EIGRP and OSPF routes also match the packet's destination, but their prefix lengths are shorter. The static route has a longer prefix length, but that route doesn't match the packet's destination, so it won't be selected. Anyway, later in the course, we will spend more time studying the concepts of AD, metric, and route selection when we look at each routing protocol in detail. In this video, I just wanted to clarify some concepts that we already studied in the CCNA. It's absolutely essential that you understand how a router decides which routes to insert into the routing table, and how it decides which route in the routing table to use to forward each packet. Now let's look at how to configure IPv4 addresses, something you of course already know, but I'll add some extra details. Notice in the diagram at the bottom that R1's G00 interface is part of multiple subnets. That's something new that I'll mention. First, I use the command show IP interface G00. Notice that it says Internet Protocol Processing is disabled. This just means that the interface does not yet have an IP address configured on it, so it won't process IP packets. So, I configure the IP addresses on G00 as indicated in the network diagram. However, you'll notice that at the end of two of the IP address commands, I added the keyword secondary. The secondary option allows multiple IPv4 addresses to be configured on the same interface. You did something similar to this before in the CCNA, when configuring router on a stick. In that case, you divided the physical interface into multiple logical sub-interfaces, and assigned a unique IP address and VLAN to each sub-interface. When configuring secondary IP addresses on an interface like this, it is a single physical and logical interface, but with multiple IP addresses. There are a few use cases for this. For example, if you are migrating from one subnet to another. You can use secondary IP addresses to temporarily allow the router to support both the old and new subnets, and then remove the old IP address and subnet after all end hosts have been moved to the new subnet. There are other use cases too but the exact use cases are not really relevant to Encore. Anyway, I checked the configuration of G00, and notice that both of the secondary IP addresses remain. Usually, if an interface has an IP address configured, and you use the IP address command again, the new IP address overwrites the old one. However, when configuring secondary IP addresses, that does not happen. That is because an interface can have only one primary IPv4 address, but it can have an unlimited number of secondary IPv4 addresses. I will include some more information about secondary IP addresses when we cover routing protocols in the course, but that's enough for now. And here are the configurations for the G01 interface. Just one lonely IP address. Secondary IP addresses are not that common, but they're a good thing to be aware of. Now let's look at a couple show commands that can be used to verify the IP addresses we configured. First up, show IP interface brief, a command you're very familiar with. Let me just point out a couple details. First, only the primary IP address displays in the output of show IP interface brief. The secondary IP addresses are not shown. Next, let's look at the method column. Manual means the IP address has been manually configured since the last boot. So the router booted up, and then I manually configured the IP addresses. However, I didn't reboot the router after that. If I did, as you'll see soon, it would display differently. Now, unset means the IP address hasn't been configured, and the router booted using a default configuration, not the startup config. When a router boots up for the first time, there is no startup config. It doesn't exist until you use a command like copy running config startup config. So I did that. I saved the config and then rebooted the device. And this is what the output looks like after saving and rebooting. Can you see the difference? 
nvram in the method column means the IP address configuration was learned from the startup config in nvram, even if there is no IP address configured. Because I saved the startup config and rebooted the router, the router didn't use the default config when booting. It used the startup config, which is saved in nvram, so that's what displays here. Now, if I changed the IP address configuration of any of these interfaces, the output here would change to manual again. A command that shows more details than show IP interface brief is show IP interface. Note that if you don't specify the interface name after the command, it will display this info for all interfaces. I've highlighted the IP address information, and notice that this command does display the secondary IP addresses. Now, I want to connect the output of this command to our final topic, which is directed broadcast, which I think gives an interesting look at how routers manage layer 3 broadcast traffic. Notice that it says directed broadcast forwarding is disabled. Let me explain that. A directed broadcast message is a message sent to the broadcast address of another subnet, not the subnet of the sending host. What does a host do when it wants to broadcast to its own subnet? When it wants to send a layer 3 broadcast to its own subnet, it will use the 255.255.255.255 broadcast address. And then of course, that will be encapsulated with an ethernet header with the all Fs broadcast MAC address. As for directed broadcast messages sent to another subnet, Routers in the path will forward these directed broadcast packets as normal unicast packets. Why is that? It's because they don't know that the message is destined for a broadcast address, because the IP header only indicates the destination IP address, not the destination subnet mask. So to them, the packet looks like a regular unicast packet. Remember, the broadcast IP address of a subnet is the last IP address in the subnet. But in order to know the last IP address of a subnet, you have to know the subnet mask. Otherwise, you don't know if the destination is in a slash 24, slash 16, slash 27, or whatever size subnet. But when the router connected to the destination subnet receives the message, it will know that the destination is a broadcast address, because it knows the subnet mask of the destination network. It is directly connected to that network. So, what does it do then? By default, it will drop the message. It won't send a directed broadcast to the connected network. However, forwarding of directed broadcast messages can be enabled with the following command on the interface the message will be broadcast out of. IP directed broadcast. Let's see an example to make it easier to understand. So, here's a new topology for this demonstration. Just four routers connected together. I will demonstrate this on R1. First, I use the command logging console debugging. That's because I am connected to R1's console port and want to view debugging messages at syslog severity level 7. Debugs are something I didn't mention in the CCNA course, but I will use them often in this course. I will also make a dedicated video about debugs later in the course. Anyway, I used the command debug IP ICMP. This will cause the router to display messages about ICMP traffic it receives. So, just to test that debug, I first sent a unicast ping from R1 to R4 at 192.168.34.4. I used repeat1 to make R1 send only one ping, to keep the output short. Then, this debug message is displayed. ICMP echo reply received, and notice the source IP of the reply is R4, 192.168.34.4. Okay, since that worked and the debug displayed properly, I then pinged the broadcast IP address of R4's subnet. So, I'm sending a directed broadcast message. What do you think happened? As you can see, I did get a reply, even though in the previous slide, I said that routers don't forward directed broadcasts by default, so R3 should have dropped it. Well, here is the reply I got to the ping. Look at the source IP address of the reply, 192.168.23.3. This is R3 replying. R3 replies to the directed broadcast ping, 
but it does not actually broadcast it out of G01. So, although R3 didn't actually broadcast the message to the 192.168.34.0 slash 24 subnet, because R3 is directly connected to the subnet, it decided to reply to the ping itself. Note that it doesn't use its 192.168.34.3 IP address as the source IP of the reply though. Instead, it uses the 192.168.23.3 IP address of G00, the interface it uses to send the reply as the source. Now let's see what happens when I enable directed broadcasts on R3. I use the command IP directed broadcast on R3's G01 interface to do so. Remember, you should enable it on the interface the message will be broadcast out of, and that is R3's G01, connected to the 192.168.34.0 slash 24 subnet. ICMP debugging is still enabled on R1. I'm just showing the command again here as a reminder. So I pinged the broadcast address of R3 and R4's subnet again. What do you think happened? This time I got two debug messages, two replies. One from R3, same as last time. It replies to the broadcast ping because it's part of the destination network. Okay, so what's the other reply? It's from R4. R3 broadcasted R1's ICMP echo request out of the G01 interface, and R4 responded to the ping. And if other hosts were connected to the segment, they would respond too. Directed broadcasts are probably not used much these days, which explains why the IP directed broadcast command is disabled by default. Directed broadcast might be used by some old applications that rely on broadcasts like this. Before wrapping up, let me clarify that this directed broadcast message is only actually broadcast when it reaches the destination network. When R1 forwards it to R2, the destination MAC is unicast, the MAC of R2's G01 interface. When R2 forwards it to R3, the destination MAC is also unicast, that of R3's G00. And then finally, it is broadcast to the all F's MAC address when R3 sends it out of G01. In this case, there is only one other device to receive the broadcast, R4, but if there were others, they would reply as well. We will test out directed broadcast in the lab video, which will be the next video. So, here's what we covered in this video. We started with bitwise XOR and AND operations, looked at layer 3 forwarding in a LAN as well as between networks, including how routers make forwarding decisions using the most specific match. Then we covered how to configure and verify IPv4 addresses, including secondary addresses. And finally, we looked at layer 3 directed broadcasts. Although the layer 3 forwarding process itself is not new to you if you studied for the CCNA, I think there was still lots of new information in this video that can help deepen your understanding. Now let's move on to the quiz to test your understanding of some of these concepts. Here's quiz question 1. Use the XOR AND method to determine if the destination of the following packet is in the same subnet as the source or not. The sender of the packet is 172.16.23.3/26, and the packet's destination is 172.16.23.65. Like I said, you won't be asked to do this on the NCORE exam, but I think it's valuable information to deepen your understanding of how networking works. Pause the video to try it out yourself, and now let's check the answer. Here is the XOR operation. There are two bits that differ, both in the last octet. Now let's use AND to compare the XOR result and the sender's subnet mask. Here it is. The AND result is not all zeros, so what does that mean? It means that the destination of the packet is in a different subnet than the source. So the packet can't be sent directly to the destination host. Okay, let's go to question 2. PC1 sends a packet to PC2. How many different destination MAC addresses will be used as the packet travels toward the destination? Pause the video now to think about the answer. Okay, let's check. This is the path the packet takes to the destination. How many different destination MAC addresses are used? First, PC1 sends it to R1, then R1 to R2, 
R2 to R3, and finally R3 to PC2. So that's four different destination MAC addresses in total. Although the destination IP address remains the same throughout the journey, the destination MAC address is changed at each hop. Okay, let's go to question three. R1 receives a packet destined for 203.0.113.77. The following routes are in R1's routing table. Which route will be selected to forward the frame? Pause the video now to select the best route for this packet. Okay, the answer is B, an EIGRP route to 203.0.113.64/27. Of the four options, only A and B match the destination. 203.0.113.77 is not included in C, 203.0.113.72/30, or D, 203.0.113.72/32. And since the slash /27 prefix in B is longer than the slash /24 in A, B is the best route. Note that both the routing protocol and metric are not relevant information for this question. The only thing that matters is the matching route with the longest prefix length, also known as the most specific match. Okay, let's go to question four. You issue the show IP interface G00 command on a Cisco iOS device and get the following output. Internet protocol processing disabled. What can you do to change this output? Pause the video now to think about the answer. Okay, the answer is B. Configure an IP address on the interface. This output is displayed when the interface is a layer three interface, such as a router's interface or a routed port on a layer three switch, but there is no IP address configured on the interface. So the router will not process IP packets on that interface. A, no switch port, is used to make a switch interface become a routed port, but that won't fix this output. C is used to configure the port to send directed broadcasts, but that also will not fix this output. And D, IP routing, enables IP routing on a layer three switch, but also will not affect this output. Okay, let's go to question five. You issue the following ping command on R1. How many ping responses will R1 receive? And what will be the source IP address or addresses of the response or responses? Note below that I have shown R2's interface configurations. Pause the video now to think about the answer. Okay, let's check the answer. Here are the results of the ping. R1 received one reply, as indicated by the single debug message. And what is the source IP of the reply? It's 192.168.12.2. R1 will receive one reply from R2 only, because IP directed broadcast is not configured on R2's G00 interface. So, by default, R2 will not broadcast the message out of its G00 interface. And the source IP address of the reply is 192.168.12.2, because that's the IP address of R2's G01 interface, the interface that will actually send the reply packet. Okay, that's all for the quiz and today's video. I hope this video was helpful. Before finishing this video, let me thank my JCNP level channel members. To become a member, please click the join button under the video. Thanks to Yonatan Makara, Boson Software, Velva Jacob, George Streeter, Funny Dart, Nasir Chowdhury, Gustavo BR, Gerard Baker, Marcel Lord, Pavel M, Mr. Erlison, Dragos Hirnea, Zakib Shah, Mir Salman, Mazin Anderson, Vitaus194, Gina Lindley, Nehemia, Bold1C1U, Mark Jackson, Michael Carroll, Gerald Guillem, Gabriel Braga, Renan Marias, Hector Hernandez, Ali Polat, Mara Tuba, R. Nelson, Roji Kuriakos, Rascal Roy Gamer YT, Owad, Arpad Konives, Five Feet, Daniel Brown, Emiliano Carena, Leonardo Souza, Tricky Mickey 123456, Scott Thompson, Jose Alvarez, Kevin Hayes, ES, William Rosario, Hussein Yavuz, and Samuel Tavares. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, but thank you so much for your support. 
Thanks to you and my other supporters, I am able to make these videos and release them for free on YouTube, so I really appreciate the support. Another great way to support the channel is to like the video, leave a comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this video with others. So if this video was helpful, I'd appreciate it if you did any of those. Thanks for watching. Thank you.